people have been managing knowledge since Abraham was a schoolboy. Consider a craftsman and his apprentices. Knowledge being shared, informally, between people. Not by writing it down and handing it over, but by shadowing, mentoring, storytelling and job rotation. We didn't call it knowledge management then, and it didn't involve codifying knowledge, writing things down, capturing knowledge. Can you capture knowledge? No, not completely. You can never capture knowledge completely. Knowledge management took off in the 1990s. Scholars divided knowledge into explicit knowledge, things that can easily be documented in books, for example, and tacit knowledge, knowledge that's inside us by virtue of who we are. Tacit knowledge includes things we don't even know we know. Scholars also describe knowledge as sticky. It sticks because we aren't motivated to share it, because the people we want to share it with don't trust us, or because they don't understand it. Knowledge is especially sticky in professional groups. If you work in a department where everyone is an accountant, it's easier to share knowledge than if you work in a multidisciplinary group. Now consider projects. A project is a temporary endeavour. People from different disciplines come to a project, dipping in and out to meet objectives, often under time pressure. How do you manage knowledge in this environment? How do you motivate people to share knowledge when they have different stakes in an endeavour that is temporary? People in a project team might be competitors in another project. Is there some knowledge they don't share because it gives them a competitive advantage in the other project? Who owns the knowledge? Organisations increasingly use projects to do what they want to do, but they don't always think about knowledge. Let's look at how KM has developed. In the 1990s, when KM became mainstream, people started to think of knowledge as an asset, a thing that could be managed. It's almost as if we invented KM, forgot everything we knew, and started again from scratch. Early KM was mostly about capturing knowledge, usually writing things down for others to read. Typical practices included lessons learned databases, best practice programs, and document management systems. The underlying assumptions were that knowledge could be captured, people would go and find it, they would understand it, they would use it, and it would work in the situation where they applied it. In the mid-1990s, we realised that these assumptions didn't really hold true. Focusing on knowledge that could be captured was all about explicit knowledge, things that can readily be articulated, captured and shared. It was, essentially, information management. We weren't tapping into deeper, tacit knowledge, things we find difficult to express, know-how, things we don't know we know, insights and experience. Tapping into this sort of knowledge requires conversations, trust and time, not writing things down. A new flavour of KM, based on connecting people, became mainstream. Typical methods were communities of practice, social network analysis and people finders, so you could find people to help you. The big assumption was that left to their own devices, people would go and find what they needed from their network. Because people needed to be motivated to share knowledge in networks, we started talking about a knowledge-sharing culture. A knowledge-sharing culture became the holy grail of KM. The information management flavour of KM didn't go away. It was still valuable. It still is valuable, but it was no longer the whole KM story. It never was the whole KM story, but we had forgotten this. Fast forward to the 2000s. We began to realise that relying on informal networks wasn't enough. We had swung from one extreme, sharing information in hierarchies, to the other, sharing knowledge in networks. We realised we needed networks and hierarchies. A new kind of community of practice emerged with objectives, structure and sponsors high up in the organisational hierarchy. 
Then social networking exploded into our lives, and any notion of control over knowledge sharing went out the window. So did the idea that knowledge is owned by a few experts. Some people embraced social networking as part of KM. Others proclaimed KM dead. If it isn't dead, KM continues to develop. New flavours have entered the mainstream. Ideas management, collective sense-making, crowdsourcing, and approaches based on analysing data using algorithms to work out what people know. KM today can mean anything from information management to crowdsourcing. Here's the thing. Project Management KM still focuses on collecting knowledge, writing it down, building knowledge stocks, especially lessons learned databases. Is Project Management KM stuck in the 1990s? The whole point of a lessons learned database is to use it. I've never seen anyone use one. I'd say the PM world is stuck somewhere before the 1990s. We know lessons learned databases don't work. So why do we still have them? If we look at learning from projects, we look at what's happened at the end of a project, but the people in the project have already gone. Some organisations try to capture knowledge at every stage of a project. There's still an underlying belief that knowledge can be captured. We try to capture knowledge so that when an individual leaves the organisation, there's something left of their knowledge. But we know we can't really capture the knowledge of a human being. Is KM in project environments really that different from KM elsewhere? Some people think it is. Trust, respect and reciprocity are important in KM. In a temporary team, say a three-month project, there isn't much time for trust to develop. You've also got knowledge is power behaviour. Even though if someone shares knowledge, they've still got it. And then there's the stickiness problem. It doesn't matter what knowledge is being shared. If you can't make sense of it, use it and add value, what good is it? But don't these difficulties exist in all environments? Work is becoming more complex. Working in projects is a response to increasing complexity. Inventing new flavours of KM is another response. Maybe the problem is that the two responses have parted company. Very few projects have built-in KM. Does your project have a budget for KM? Does your project have a KM champion? We don't see projects as opportunities for integrating knowledge, creating new knowledge and learning. We end up learning while galloping on a horse and we don't have time to reflect on our experiences. It would be great to build KM into project budgets, but why should the client pay for it? Would it cost more? If you put the effort in at the start, you'll save time and money later on. But isn't knowledge the whole basis of projects? Have you ever heard anyone say, I want a team that's never done this kind of project before? If we don't have KM, Clients are buying the same mistakes. What clients should be saying is, I want a project that will create new knowledge for my unique circumstances. We need to give people time to reflect. That's how we learn. What can we do to improve KM in project environments? We could look at the big picture. Not who benefits from KM. We're all in this together. Effective KM will improve the quality of the projects we do. Programmes and portfolios can last for five, ten years. Time for trust to build. There's an opportunity here. PMOs. PMOs have a huge role to play. They join all those short-term projects together. Yes, then KM could be seen as a benefit from short-term projects. Don't professional associations have a role to play here? They're not playing it effectively. They protect their knowledge assets so they can make money out of them. They should be building communities, facilitating conversations between members, making sure knowledge flows informally, not making sure it's codified and up for sale. Even if we treat knowledge as a commodity, a saleable product, isn't it only worth what you do with it? Just because you've got a large bank of lessons learned, it doesn't mean anyone has learned anything. Maybe it's the way project managers are trained. 
You can put knowledge in front of people, senior managers, and they don't take it in. Yes, you can perceive something but not internalise it. That's not knowledge. It's only when you internalise it that you know. Doesn't all this come down to the philosophical arguments around the definition of knowledge and learning? Yes, absolutely. It's pretty fundamental, isn't it? Different views of knowledge and learning have led to lots of different flavours of KM. Maybe we should raise awareness, help people understand that KM can mean many different things, that knowing is a process of learning, and it's only valuable when it leads to doing things differently. Is that it? Is KM valuable only when it leads to doing things differently? What do you think?